to recall. We used density points, Lebesgue density points. to prove that transitive isometries are ergodic. With respect to Lebesgue, not sure. And there were two key takeaways. For an isometry, balls are exactly preserved. They're sent to balls, and in fact, balls of the same radius. And secondly, isometries preserve density. So meaning that if I have a set and it has a certain density in another set, and I apply F to the N, the density of the image in the image set is the same for an isometry. All right. So that was like example one, if you like. Here's example two. I'm going to give a proof that the doubling map, x goes to 2x, or let's say f of x equals 2x mod 1 on r mod z is ergodic. In fact, it's ergodic with respect to any uh, invariant measure. Well, it, it's ergodic with respect to the bag measure. OK. So proof. So either using the Lebesgue density theorem or using the exercise from yesterday, you can show the following. So LDT, Lebesgue, different, uh, Lebesgue density theorem, or exercise two from yesterday, we can show the following. If x is the subset of r mod z, well, a Borel measurable set in r mod z, with positive measure, then there exists a dyadic interval Uh, interval I in the circle. Let me draw a picture. So here X would be any set, any set of positive measure, right? But somewhere. Let's say this is the origin, which is equivalent to 1 under the identification of the circle with r mod z. And somewhere, I can find an interval i whose endpoints, I'll draw it, whose endpoints are of the form 
over 2 to the m, comma, k plus 1 over 2 to the m for some k between 0 and 2 to the uh, m minus 1. Right? I can take the circle and I can partition it such that, so you can partition a circle into intervals of this form, and you can let m go to infinity, and we get smaller and smaller such intervals. And the exercise yesterday shows that there's some interval somewhere where this set x, this positive measure set x, has very high density. So I'm going to add a quantifier here. So given epsilon greater than 0, there exists such an interval such that the density of the set x in that interval i is greater than 1 minus epsilon. Okay. Now suppose that x is f invariant. So suppose that f of x equals x or f inverse of x equals x, but that will imply that f of x equals x. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look inside this interval, and we're going to apply the dynamics. Now, the dynamics is not going to move this interval around, but it's going to do something else very nice, which is if we apply enough iterates, as we apply iterates, it expands each time by a factor of 2 until when we've applied m iterates to this interval, we get the whole circle. OK? So note that f to the m of i, so I made that interval half open. We note that f to the m of i equals r mod c. Because if I take f to the m of i, I'm going to, if I don't do this mod 2, I get the interval k comma k plus 1. If I, I'm sorry, if I don't do this mod 1, I just keep multiplying out. Multiplication commutes with taking things mod 1. If I do that m times, I get the interval k comma k plus 1. And then when you take that mod 1, you get 0, 1, which is the whole circle. All right. And so, what happens to the density? Well, what, what happens to the density of f to the m of x? On the one hand, the density of f to the m of x over f to the m of i, this density, by definition, is the measure of the intersection divided by the measure of f to the m of i. Now notice f here is not an invertible map. So the measure, if I apply, well, this is correct. And this is equal to the measure, now I'll make my note, of f to the m of x intersect i, because um, because it is, uh, divided by the measure of f to the m of i. That's because i is a very small interval. So why can I go from here to here? Because i is a small interval on which f to the m is injective. So going backwards, there's no issues. So the inter this is, in fact, the image of the intersection is, in fact, the intersection of the images. OK, so it's this ratio. OK, now, now what I want to say is, well, the measure of f to the m of this intersection is not the same as the measure of this intersection. Because even though f preserves measure, F, 
that, that F inverse, which doesn't even exist, does not preserve measure. This is not F inverse, this is F. And so, in fact, the measure of this, because we're looking at Lebesgue measure, the, the measure of this set is going to get scaled at each step by a factor of two. Okay, so this is two to the, whoops, two to the m times the measure of x intersect i. And again, in the denominator, it's two to the m times the measure of i. I now beautifully and quite remarkably and unusually, these two numbers cancel. And so this is equal to the measure of x intersect i divided by the measure of i, which is this conditional measure, which we've chosen i so that this is greater than 1 minus epsilon. So on the one hand, we have this. On the other hand, since um, f to the m of x equals x, and f to the m of i equals the whole circle, that conditional measure well, the measure of x is equal to the conditional measure, the measure of x conditioned on the whole circle. That's always the case. And that equals, because of this, the conditional measure of um, uh, f to the m of x in f to the m of i. And so what have we shown? We've shown that the measure of x, I think you maybe can't read this little bit. Thus, the measure of x equals what I wrote over there, f to the m of x in f to the m of i. Equals by what we've said over here, the, the density of x in i is greater than 1 minus epsilon. So mu of x positive and invariant implies that mu of x is greater than 1 minus epsilon for all epsilon. And so therefore, mu of x is 1. And that shows that there are no f invariant sets, measurable sets, of positive measure other than those with full measure. So therefore, f is ergodic. So what are the key, what are the key things we used here? Questions about the proof? Again, we're not using any smooth, you're not seeing any derivatives pop up here. Well, secretly you are. <laughs> these are derivatives, these two to the m's here. Someone's messing with my lights. Does that make it easier to see? No? <laughs> Just choose something, though, because it's like... <laughs> having some kind of epileptic seizure here. So what are the, the key properties of f of x equals 2x that we used here? Well, one is that f 
maps dyadic intervals onto the circle. Um, one to one and onto R mod Z. So the fact that under, so So any interval, if I wait long enough, will um, map onto the whole circle. The other key property is that F preserves the shape. Well, I guess that's kind of implicit in, in what I've said here. The other key property is that F preserves density. And I said this before. For transitive isometries, sorry, could I have either both set all of them on or all of them off? I don't know who's controlling the lights. Who's, what? No. This way is better. Bad. Could someone please turn these lights off? Thank you. If you want, you could turn overhead lights. No, no. Oh, this is worse? This is OK. OK, fine. Good God. This is really strange. I feel like I'm um, lecturing in the middle of the night somehow. <laughs> OK. And so the second is that F preserves density, i.e., the measure, or the conditional measure, who's doing this? Can you please, no, it's just happening? OK. The conditional measure for any m, and this is key, if I take any m, if I look at the density of f to the m of uh, some set x inside of f to the m, of y, that's the same as the conditional measure of x in y. And now let's just for a minute review why that is the case. So this equals the measure of the intersection. So because f is injective, uh, I should say, um, f preserves density on injective domains. So as long as um, y, f restricted to y, is, is injective, this is a true statement. So because we have the change of variables formula, which I'm going to write now. So the conditional measure uh, mu of uh, f to the m uh, of x, sorry, I already wrote that. This is equal to the intersection write it this way since it's injective And now, the change of variables, these are Lebesgue measurable sets. We're in dimension one. So if I want the measure of the image and my thing is injective, what do I do? I integrate f, the derivative of f to the m prime of x uh, dx over the set x intersect y. And I divide by the integral over y of f to the m prime, or so I should say d mu of x, the big measure, uh, of x, d mu of x. Now, in the case that we're considering, the linear case, this is constant and equal to 2 to the m. And this is constant and equal to 2 to the m times the measure of x1.
and those cancel, and we get this density. Now, what? What's M? Oh, it's M dyadic. Uh, what? Right. Yes. No, it's two to the M. It's okay. No, don't. It's fine. It's always good to clear it because I bet other people have thought that. Okay. So, um, and this is the conditional measure. Everything cancels. Okay. But now, suppose that we just changed f of x equals 2x just a little bit, right? And we wanted to see what happens to density. Well, let's suppose um, on the other hand, if f prime is not constant, And the measure of um, x in y is very small. So in general, in our proofs, we, we're actually interested in, in controlling small densities, which is the same as kind of getting large densities. If you can show that a density of x and y is very small, then you know that the complement has high density. And it's typically easier to show low densities are preserved than high densities are preserved, are preserved. So on the other end, if this happens to be small, that does not say less than epsilon, then the best naive bound on the ratio or, or the, the density, sorry, of f to the m of x and f to the m of y, given what I've got here, is just this is less than or equal to, well, the soup, the absolute largest value that I can get overall x in, well, overall x in x intersect y of the absolute value. This should, this should be, um, this, it doesn't matter. I'm assuming the derivative is positive, but I'm assuming orientation preserving. But um, in general, if I had just a, a, a map from the real line to the real line, the, an upper bound on the numerator is the soup, and a lower bound on the denominator is the, the, an inf. And if I have a, a, a bound, like this is less than epsilon, then this will be less than epsilon times this ratio. And what I want to impress on you is that if we think about our proof, we were not allowed to choose m in advance. We chose epsilon. Epsilon determined an m in which we had density bigger than 1 minus epsilon. And then we had to iterate m times where m could be extremely large. And we wanted to show that density, high density was preserved, or equivalently, low density was preserved. And here, the largest value of f to the m prime, it might be, suppose I'm very close to the doubling map, but I'm not the doubling map. This could be something like on the order of 2 plus some small number eta, right, to the m, whereas this down here could be on the order of 2 minus eta to the m. 
times epsilon first C1 map. And you'll notice that as m goes to infinity, this goes to infinity. So this proof that I just gave you uses very heavily the fact that the derivatives were precisely on the nose constant everywhere. And a main theme in smooth dynamics is that one needs to be able to bound quantities like this for nonlinear maps. And if you can do this for all m on some interval, what you've achieved is what's called a distortion estimate. So a distortion estimate says that if I choose you know, an interval, well, if I choose some image, I can go back as far as I want, and the ratio of the max and the min of the derivatives f to the m is bounded, independent of m. All right. So that's getting a little bit ahead to the nonlinear setting. But I, I will come back to this, but I wanted to emphasize that this proof still needs some work if we want it to do anything more than just f of x equals 2x mod 1. OK. So now let's go to example 3. That's the cat map. So if we let a be 2, 1, 1, 1, then the map f sub a on t2 is ergodic, which we know. We already know this because of, um, because of Fourier series, so from Kadim's lecture. Um, but let's see if we can try to do a proof with density points. Well, what happens? Yes? I'm using, where am I using f of x equals x? It, b both, are the, both are true. It, yeah, it, it works out fine, yeah. I know, that's something that's like, wait, what? No, it's because you're looking at the intersection of x with a little interval on which f is injective. So it, it, you do get that f to the n of, yeah. yeah. But it, it looks like, I know, it's a good point. To think about that, yeah. Um, in fact, I, I, right, I, I should have said f inverse of x equals x, because that's actually, that's actually an assumption that you need for, to prove ergodicity, not f of x equals x. But that's OK, because f inverse of x equals x implies f of x equals x. So I should have made this my assumption. OK, so thanks. I really used that. OK. Anyway, so how would we try to prove this with density points? Well, we could do something very similar. So you know, suppose here f is invertible, so we can do it either way. Uh, suppose f of x or f inverse of x equals x inside, and this is f sub a. Well, if we remember our picture of what the cat map does, if this is the torus, Suppose mu of x has positive measure, so x is some invariant set with positive measure, then somewhere, yes, indeed, I can find a very small ball. In which I have very high concentration of x. OK, 
So, well, what happens if I iterate under f? What happens to this ball? Well, if you remember the picture from my first lecture, what happens is we have these two special eigendirections for A. And these two eigendirections, the derivative of f sub A is, is, is A. Let's call this x naught. Is everywhere a, right? As constant derivative, just like f of x equals 2x, I constant derivative 2. This is constant derivative a. So everywhere, if I look close to a point and I look in its tangent space, I have these two eigendirections. And this eigendirection, so this point is mapped somewhere else. Maybe it's mapped here, I, right? Maybe. Maybe it's probably more likely to be mapped, say, over here. OK. Uh, and this direction here is contracted. So if this is some arbitrary point x, then here's f sub a of x. And the linear map takes this eigendirection to this one and contracts it by some factor that I'll call 1 over lambda. And this direction is expanded by factor lambda. What is lambda? Well, you can solve the characteristic equation. And it's the larger of the two. Um, I have to always write down the characteristic equation x squared minus 3x plus 1 equals 0. And so the larger solution is 3 plus root 5 over 2, which, by the way, is the square of the golden mean. That's the square of 1 plus root 5 over 2. And actually, the slope here, just for fun, the slope is uh, one is 1 over the golden mean. OK, which is an irrational number. And here the slope is minus the golden mean. OK, so now I've really cluttered my picture. My point was simply the following, that if I take a nice ball in which I have high density and I iterate it forward, I no longer have a nice ball. I have an ellipse. Well, if I iterate it a lot, <laughs> I'm going to get, well, you saw what happened to the cat, right? I'm going to get something that's elliptical, but alarmingly thin and not small at all. So even though f is a diffeomorphism, and indeed, what's the, what would be the, the formula for the density the change in density for f sub a, we could do the same calculation. And maybe I'm going to remind you what it is. So here, the density of a set of uh, f to the m of some set x in f to the m of another set y. Um, F is a diffeomorphism, so it's injective, so I don't have to worry about a lot of things. Well, in this case, this is going to be equal to the integral over x intersect y, not of f prime, because after all, this is a f prime is a matrix, but it's the absolute value of the determinant of the derivative. It's this. Yeah, it's this. 
And by fortunate accident, because again, we have a linear map, it is the case. Well, this is just the determinant, the determinant of a to the m over the determinant of a to the m times the density of x and y. So the density of x and y is preserved, because these are the same. This is 1, right? In fact, even if this wasn't 1, as long as f were injective on that little ball, these would cancel, OK? So we do in, indeed have that density is preserved. But the problem is balls are not preserved. And so while we know that the density of this invariant set does not change in its image, its image is useless. The, the image of the ball is useless from the perspective of the Lebesgue density theorem. We can't get this density point to a density point for the complement while keeping it a density point. <laughs> OK, so density points a priori If, for example, if we tried to employ the strategy for transitive maps or transitive isometries, which recall that means I want to take a density point from my invariant set x to a density point for the complement of x, which we called x prime. Well, we can do that. <laughs> so I mean, I haven't proved that this is transitive. But the transitivity part works. So we can do that. We can take x close to x prime if we wanted. Um, f sub a is transitive, and that's much easier to prove than ergodicity, which I hope to impress on you. I hope we're, well, it's impossible to impress on you how much easier for a, an area preserving map, it's much easier to establish transitivity than ergodicity. But um, so we could get x close to x prime, but the point is the picture looks like this. Huge amounts, huge amounts of x. Huge amounts of x prime. But if we apply f to the m, this will still be huge in the image. But maybe the image it looks like an incredibly flat ellipse. And so here's f to the m of x. And indeed, the green has huge density in this highly elongated ellipse. But that's completely useless. It could just occupy, it's so skinny, it could occupy that 1% of this ball that is not x prime. So this argument fails. <laughs> and the reason is it fails because well, f does not preserve the shape of balls. At all. It doesn't even roughly preserve the shape of balls. All right. So we need a new idea. And the new idea is very closely related to, to Karina's uh, lectures. Um, there's another dynamical system that's lurking here type of dynamical system that's lurking in the map to 111. And we need to use that other dynamical system to help us prove that invariant sets 
must be trivial. So, um, key new idea. F sub A has what are called stable and unstable foliations. So recall my little, well, you don't have to recall. Just look over here. That little infinitesimal picture where the derivative of f everywhere just acts like a. That's a microscopic or an infinitesimal, not even microscopic, but an infinitesimal picture. But in fact, <coughs> since that picture <coughs> holds everywhere, we have a global picture. So suppose, for starters, I take <coughs> this line. Is that a square? Remotely a square. No. So suppose we take this line of slope. Uh, I believe it's 1 over the golden mean. So we take the line in R due, and we do as Karina did, and we project that line onto the torus. And we want to stay parallel, which is hard to do when you're close to the board. Okay. And so what you've seen is that, not so parallel, is that, in fact, because this slope, if we call this theta, then I think using Karina's notation, tangent theta, which is less than 1 in this case, uh, is irrational. Consequently, this line, you can go backwards with it too, this line winds densely through the torus. Okay. Now, any point, I can do the same for any other point. So here, I've associated this, this line that's immersed in the torus. It never intersects itself, but it, it's dense. So this, I'm going to call WU of the origin. That's because this, this is 0. But through any other point, I can do the same. I can just translate the origin, wherever I want, to any other point. So maybe I start here. Um, I wish I had like two different shades of green, although for the colorblind in this room, I guess that wouldn't be so useful. Actually, I guess that would be better than using red. OK, so here's the lighter shade of green. But I could do the same. I can take this line. So if this is the point just x, I can project this line to the torus. And I get a line that's distinct from the other line. And it, too, winds densely through the torus. And I'm going to call this wu of x. And as a set, it's just wu of 0 plus x, like literally the set sum inside of um, well, you could either do it upstairs and project, or you can project and do it downstairs because addition commutes with projection. The, the <coughs> torus is a group. Okay. And so this collection of lines partitions the torus. I'm going to give it a name. I'll, I'll call it WU. It partitions. It's a partition of the torus, a, a hideous one in some sense. But locally, it doesn't look so bad. And so it's a partition. So the union WU of x just trivially, 
is, is T2. Um, in fact, it generates a, a nice equivalence relation. Two points are uh, Say that so I won't. Okay. As any partition does. Okay. It partitions the torus. It has it's invariant, so you can check these properties. In the sense that if I take any x in T2, so by the way, I mean if I took an x prime, so I, I should say this, if I take an x prime in w u of x, then w u of x prime is equal to w u of x, right? So it's not like, oh, I take an x prime, and this is part of being a partition. If I take an x prime, it's not like I get some different line. Okay, it's invariant. So for any x in T2, we have the following properties. If I take f of w u of x, I get w u of f of x. The leaves of w u, by which I mean, so the leaf through x, I denote by w u of x. So that's called a leaf. It's an element of the partition. Are uniformly, well, they're uniformly expanded uh, by f. But more importantly, in fact, they're uniformly contracted by f inverse. So here's a weak, something stronger is true. There's actually a, uh, an exponential rate of, of contraction, but we'll talk about this later. If I have uh, two points, uh, let's just call it y, okay, and they lie in the same uh, leaf, it's called an unstable leaf. That implies that the distance between f a to the minus n of x and f a to the minus m of y goes to 0 uniformly. I'm sorry, x prime. It's also true for y, but goes to 0 uniformly as m goes to infinity. Locally, I can, if I forget, like, what the leaves belong to, like, this might belong to the same leaf as this. But if I just draw, like, a little local box here, I can't really tell whether two of these leaves belong to each other. So locally, these are intersections. These are connected components. I'll go a minute over or two. Uh, these are the connected components of W U intersect some kind of box of the leaves of W U. These are called plaques and denoted W U loc. If I have a point, this plaque is denoted by W U loc of x. Locally, there's a smooth change of coordinates. There's a change of coordinates. In this case, it's affine. So that the plaques actually just look like little line segments. They look like coordinate disks in this case. This property. Plus this, funny I, I put this first and last. Those two properties together are basically the definition of a foliation. 
A foliation is a, is a partition of a manifold into smooth submanifolds, like the torus, into lines. So that locally, the elements of the partition look like, literally, by some change of coordinates, look like just horizontal, like a stack of pancakes. OK. So great. So we have a foliation. Its leaves are invariant, or the foliation is preserved, and the leaves are contracted under F inverse. Similarly, and it also happens to have irrational slope, but actually that's not super needed for what I'm going to say. So also, there exists a foliation. So there exists something called WS, called the stable foliation. It's orthogonal in this case to the unstable foliation. It's orthogonal to WU. So this is called the unstable foliation. And it has the same properties, except that the leaves of WS are uniformly contracted but not under F inverse, but under F. These are parallel to the stable eigen direction. And now Hannah in the next lecture is going to explain, or maybe not next, but the follow-up to this lecture, is going to explain how we can use these two foliations to prove ergodicity. I just want to make a, a quick little observation that we can prove something even, it's almost an exercise, and maybe it should be an exercise. <laughs> so ergodicity says that you have no invariant integrable functions, no invariant L1 functions. My observation is that once we have these two foliations, it's now easy to prove. So when I said F invariant, yeah, FA, good, this is FA, to show that there does not exist an FA invariant continuous function. And mostly, I'll just leave you to think about this. But, but briefly, the reason is, suppose I had a, a function that was invariant and continuous. Well, let's take a point and look at, let's look at it stable. I didn't draw the stable foliation, but here's the stable what the leaves of the stable foliation look like. They're lines that wind densely. Take some point. Take another point on the stable foliation, OK? And look at the two values of f, or phi, sorry, my continuous function. Well, if phi is invariant, then when I apply f, the values don't change. But I can get the values as close as I want by applying f, right? So for every epsilon, the value of phi at a point here, I keep saying phi, I mean c. The value of c here and the value of c here actually are the same if I have a continuous function that's invariant. So c is constant on this. Now, if I want, I could just use the fact that this is dense. And I could say, well, I have a function. It's constant. In a dense set, it's constant. Maybe I don't know it's dense. But I could do the same argument going backwards now to show that c has to be constant along this leaf. And so now, if I look at one of these little boxes, what I call these foliation boxes, I have a function that's constant along stable plaques, 
and is constant along unstable plaques, which if I just look at a, <laughs> the picture in R2, I have a continuous function that's constant along these lines and constant along these lines. It's, it's constant. Okay? So that's a warm-up kind of idea how you can use these two invariant foliations to prove ergodicity of this map. And this modulo a lot of technical details is how you can prove, remember the example I gave with epsilon sine blah, 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 that you can prove ergodicity for that map as well. Okay, I've gone over, so I think we should end.